Okay, thanks again for bearing with us. We're going to conclude uh, Nessus with uh, our ever popular panel discussion. Um, this year's uh, panel discussion is on the theme of, uh, of data and decisions in NBA basketball, a peek into the minds of NBA statisticians. So we're very uh, honored today to have this panel of, uh, of three, uh, three panelists. Uh, I'd like to introduce, uh, introduce you to each one of them in succession. The first is Michael Zarin. Uh, Mike Zarin is the Celtics Assistant General Manager and Associate Team Counsel. Mike is widely recognized as one of the leaders in the field of advanced statistical analysis of basketball players and teams, and is an important part of the team's players' personnel evaluation and strategic planning processes. Mike is the team's salary cap and legal expert and is responsible for the development of new technologies for team use, including the team's best-in-class statistical database and video archive slash delivery system. Mike was previously a management consultant, during which time he performed econometric and other quantitative analyses for Fortune 500 firms across a wide variety of uh, in industries. And uh, for those of us uh, who have who don't have better things to do, we can keep time until Mike uh, says no comment. <laughs> so, Mike Zarin. Hey. We're also honored to have Ken Catanella. Uh, Ken uh, currently works at the NBA, providing the league office and NBA team management with basketball analytics uh, capabilities. Prior to joining the NBA, he was coordinator of statistical analysis for the New Jersey Nets. Following graduation from Amherst College, Catanella worked on Wall Street providing analysis on stadium and arena financings for professional teams. Ken was a collegiate player and assistant coach at Amherst. He played professionally for the German Bundle, I'm not going to get this pronounced correctly, uh, Bundle, 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 Bundesliga. Bundesliga. Or the football guys. Okay, Cologne 99ers, and later served as the team's assistant GM. While earning his MBA at Duke University, Ken was a graduate assistant on Duke's 2004-2005 men's basketball teams. He developed analytical scouting methods for Duke's coaches and concurrently interned with the assistant GM of the Philadelphia 76ers. So please welcome uh, Ken. And finally, we have Aaron Barzilai, uh, who joined the Memphis Grizzlies this year as their basketball analyst. He earned his bachelor's degree at MIT, where he played on the varsity basketball team. After MIT, Aaron earned a master's degree and PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford University. Aaron has worked in the pharmaceutical, financial services, and online publishing industries, spending the majority of his career at a global consulting firm. In his spare time, Aaron developed and operates basketballvalue.com. So please welcome Aaron. So we have a, a minor tragedy to report. Uh, we were supposed to get Greg Dickerson as the moderator for this discussion, and what we're left with is a look-alike, <laughs> which would happen to be Scott Evans. Um, so we apologize that, uh, on behalf of Greg Dickerson, uh, that he has not been able to join us. Um, since I had just short notice for... Um, Introducing Scott, I'm going to read some notes that I took from two years ago when uh, we were putting together some, uh, uh, some introductions of each other. So this is probably the best I can do in introducing Scott. Um, lettered three sports in college. Best basketball player in New Hampshire. Uh, Scott was the Pepsi Hot Shot Contest winner of New England, representing the Celtics. He was the third country 12 to 13 year old in competitor, grad school racquetball, on pro tour, won matches, ranked 80th on the tour, and then I have some note about Sudzi Manchik, who, as I understand, is the Tiger Woods of racquetball. So um, please welcome uh, Scott Evans, the moderator. I didn't understand any of that. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I do apologize uh, that our original uh, moderator is uh, unable to uh, be with us today, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, what I hope to do is uh, sort of get the panel started, but then uh, hope to bring in the crowd. Uh, I'm sure uh, questions and comments will develop, and uh, we'd like to keep this uh, somewhat interactive. Um, 
But to get started, I think perhaps the, the, uh, uh, the first question that comes to mind as, uh, as we've gone through uh, uh, the day and uh, questions that have developed over the day is, uh, do you guys think that Mark looks like Jeff Van Gundy? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, there's, there's been... Uh, 95%. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure the deviation. This is an NBA panel. You know. um, but let me just start off. I know that we've had a number of uh, students and, and people who are in uh, both undergrads and graduate school uh, that have participated as part of the symposium. And maybe I could uh, get each of you to perhaps comment on uh, uh, exactly what your role is uh, with uh, uh, the NBA and, and your respective teams and how you got where you got uh, in terms of uh, your career. And if you were um, sort of talking to a, a student who was uh, perhaps interested in doing what you do, um, what, what, would you, what would you say to them? Um, so perhaps, Ken, maybe we can start on the far side. Sure. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you for having me and for us. Uh, it's an honor to, to talk with you all here, and uh, it's been an honor to listen to your presentations thus far. I really enjoyed hearing them. Took copious notes, and I'll be taking them back and trying to figure them all out tonight. Uh, the brief bio, I think, kind of gave a, a hint as to my background. It was originally as a player. Uh, which I found has been helpful in terms of the analysis and the commu communication of analysis. Uh, thereafter, it was more in academia. My suggestion to those just getting started is to get a feel for what are the basics of the area, basketball analytics. I know uh, in a couple of the journals some basic uh, writings have been put together as far as what are the commonly accepted basketball analytics methods or uh, metrics. That would be a good starting place, but it sounds like this is a pretty sophisticated crowd. So I would suggest for this crowd more get lots of practice. Uh, find an end user that's actually interested, whether it's a high school coach, a college coach, uh, a general manager, it doesn't matter. Someone you can have deep conversations with that will probe you and your ideas and test them and ask you real world questions that aren't necessarily of a statistical bent but that will make you go back to the drawing board many times because it'll make your analysis that much better. Uh, hopefully that gives it just a brief answer. I want yep. to give the other guys a chance to talk. Oh, uh, sure. Okay, well, I would say that uh, you know, first, I think the students that are here already are in really great shape that they're aware that this kind of work goes on and that people are doing it. I think that uh, I certainly did not realize that when I was uh, uh, you know, undergrad or in grad school. Um, so I think that's the first step. And then I think really the key is to take a, a long-term view. I think it, it takes a while to, uh, to uh, get into the business. I think you really need to have the love and sort of be willing to do it essentially as a hobby on the side. Um, you know, I think it's pretty rare to sort of set out to do something like this, sort of, you know, come to a conference, graduate from college, get a job, uh, something like that. I think much more you have to sort of, you know, establish yourself and establish yourself over the long term because there are a lot of people I think that are interested in doing uh, statistics in the NBA, let alone uh, the other leagues. And, uh, you know, I think really kind of establishing your reputation, getting to know the people. I think the community is, uh, you know, I think we're well represented here today, but it's really uh, not incredibly large. So I think it can be done, but, you know, you really need to take the long-term view that this is the kind of work that I love and that I'd be willing to do it even if I never ended up working with the team because I just like sort of contributing to the field. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the common thread up here is all of us did this stuff for free for a while. Um, you know, I, I worked for free for the Celtics for, for two years, basically, one while in law school and, and uh, another while working by day for a federal judge, um, which got interesting when there were death penalty cases and I had to trade deadline. And it was, anyway, um, <laughs> I'm not even joking. Uh, but um, uh, it was in Ohio, so they have the death penalty out there. Um, but... Uh, uh, every one of us worked a long, every one of us worked a long time on this stuff um, for free. Uh, and so it's got to be something that you love doing. Um, I think m most of, I, you know, I have no clue about you guys, but most of the people I know doing this sort of work could be making more money somewhere else doing other sorts of work. Um, and so um, you, don't, you don't do it because you know you think there's this job out there waiting for you. There aren't a lot of jobs. It's a field that actually, um, you know, it's it's sort of weird to think that Dean Oliver was telling me that he thinks I'm the person who's been doing this full time the longest, which is very very bizarre for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Probably true. 
But uh, you know, a lot of the teams interested in these things now have people working for them, and so it's getting harder and harder to sort of break into the field. So you really need to be um, willing to work for free and willing to differentiate yourself somehow. I think that's, that's the best advice. Mm -hmm. And keep up with the community, right? There's yeah. message boards, there's conferences like this. Uh, you know, I think tying in and talking to the folks that are here, uh, you know, in the audience as well. Yeah, Aaron's us. proof. I mean, yeah, I, I remember proof. three years ago he walked up to me at a conference <laughs> and, uh, after a basketball analytics panel, and I've known him ever since, and we stayed in touch, and and, and look at him now. So, <laughs> <laughs> give you my uh, phone number a few times before you say to him. Yeah, that was before basketball value. That was. Um, that was. So a lot yeah. of work has happened since then, and uh, and it paid off. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask a practical question. You all have uh, NBA connections, and uh, Practical question is uh, uh, what data are exactly available to you via the NBA office or el elsewhere, and so a lot of these, uh, a lot of the quote-unquote data may be uh, essentially videotapes and things like this. And then somehow, what does it take to take that data from a videotape and actually put it into um, some format where you can actually make something out of it and do do some sort of analysis? So, so what data are available, for, for one? And two, what does it take to, to make that data into something uh, that, that's actually useful for analysis? Go this way again as a good I think, there's, no, I think there's actually like a legitimately good progression. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> um, for the most part, I've seen it on both angles. I've seen it at the team level and now at the league level. Uh, we provide the play-by-play -play information, much like in the other sports we hear about in these uh, discussions we've had that make great use of the, the football and the baseball data and, and the presentations you all have made. Uh, we have similar data at the NBA. Uh, Aaron actually has done some excellent work to extract that just from the public sites that are available, be it uh, NBA.com or ESPN.com. But the teams do have access to, whether it be live feeds or, uh, especially if they're in arena, like Mike a lot of times can get things very quickly and directly to his arena. Uh, so they have access to the actual, whatever data we have. The uh, video can be extracted in several different ways, whether it's through the NBA. They have what's called a, we have what's called a media archive, which logs every play of every game. Um, and then there's also some other vendors, such as Synergy Sports, that does an excellent job as well with that, that information. So I'll let you talk about maybe the application of uh, the information, if you'd like. Yeah, I mean, I can't really comment on the video. I've, uh, as I just uh, joined the, the Grizzlies recently, I've mostly been focused on public data sources, which, um, A, I think uh, could be more useful to the pe folks in the audience that are not with the team currently. Um, really working, uh, you know, with the play-by-play -play stuff, I just happen to sort of uh, try and clean it a little and aggregate it, uh, the information that's off of uh, NBA.com. But there's a lot of other uh, very good sites. Got to give a plug to uh, our friend Justin Kabatko and uh, Basketball Reference. I uh, look at that a lot, and there's some other, um, you know, very good sort of public work out, out there. I know particularly Kevin Pelton and John Hollinger are names of uh, folks that uh, have done a lot of work that's in the public domain. And I think that... You know, I think there are some teams that uh, have a lot of proprietary information uh, and are, uh, <laughs> um, you know, have done a lot of work and work to advance the field. But I think a lot of other teams, uh, you know, haven't even, uh, I would guess, kind of really scratched the surface with all that can be done uh, with the public stuff, which at some level is, a, uh, I think, a first, a first step for those teams that haven't done it. And I think hopefully with the work Ken's been doing, that's all going to uh, even be more accessible to the NBA teams in the future. Yeah, so just so everyone knows, there's uh, at the scorer's table in every arena, there's two people uh, entering things on a touchscreen computer, and that's actually where all, if you watch ESPN Gamecast, all that streams right. out from those computers um, and into a database that, that Ken helps run. And uh, hopefully if everything works right, it comes right back to us uh, from all of the arenas uh, pretty much live. Um, and then we, we added some other data, some things that we track ourselves, some things that we get from some third-party vendors. Um, uh, it can get linked to video, which provides some very, very interesting uh, results. Um, uh, you know, this company that's called Synergy that Ken was referring to, um, they do some great things. If I just want to see Paul Pierce pick and rolls on the left side in the fourth quarter, you know, it's like two clicks from my desktop, and those, those just show up. And, and I can burn them to a DVD or put them on a, a portable media player for a player very, very quickly. So that, that's... That's actually pretty drastically revolutionized the way our coaching staff and our scouting staff um, work with video. That, that's, that's been a big, big change recently in addition to sort of statistical developments because, you know, when you think about it, video is just data too. It's just bigger data. And so um, um, 
in some ways the, the sort of NBA data revolution is happening more on the video side than on the statistical side, although both are happening very, very quickly. Yeah. So, so in the future, how, um, um, if you were to look ahead five, ten years uh, in terms of data collection, where, where are we going to be? What are, the, what are the types of things uh, that you sort of envision um, happening in terms of just increasing the amount of data that's available to us and, and that sort of thing? Is there any... Actually, uh, the NBA has uh, perhaps some plans within the next couple of years, I've heard, that uh, um, either, I don't know if it's instituting a new camera that's going to bring in uh, some additional data. Perhaps uh, are you able to comment on uh, either, either about that specifically or about um, just in general, where do you think we're headed? As, you, as we look back at the history of the, the, the information overload over the past decade, decade uh, and thinking about where we're going to be, you know, five or ten years from now. Um, any comments or thoughts about that? Well, there's clearly potential to do a lot of different things. Uh, whether it's going to be accurate and whether it affects the play of the game will always be probably, in my opinion, what would drive things. Not necessarily, this isn't coming from the league. Uh, I know NBA Entertainment is working very hard to provide some of the things you mentioned. I think they showed it to a few media uh, people during the finals. I'm not sure what the timing is on that, and I'll, I'll leave that to our PR people to discuss. But clearly, there are a lot of other things that we could track that would add value to their lives. And I've seen it firsthand in terms of my role. So you, you take it to a certain limit, and you can only analyze that information so far. So that's why teams like Boston are tracking their own information to complement the data we already have. That's why firms like Synergy have been tracking other things to complement. Uh, the information we have, we think that uh, for the most part, the, the most important thing is to get it right. So if, if you add a lot of different things, there is potential for some manual error or human error. However, I would, as, as a guy that comes, comes from their backgrounds, I would love to have more information. So I'm constantly discussing it and trying to get those types of things implemented. But no, there's nothing specific on the immediate horizon. Uh, however, I think in the long term, some of the big things that you're thinking of uh, will be implemented and ultimately accessible to the fans as well. The, mm -hmm. the league provides us right now with you know, all the things that you see in the box score. We know who's on the court every time one of those things happen, what time it is, um, shot location, things like that. Um, most of the things that you can see on ESPN GameCast. But what we don't know is where everyone on the floor is. You think that would be a pretty basic thing, like you want to know where people are on the floor. Um, we don't, we don't know that right now. Um, in soccer, from the soccer presentation this morning, there was a mention of ProZone scores. ProZone's actually a company that's installed eight cameras in it in every Premier League stadium. And uh, so they actually, you, if you watch a Premiership game, you'll see uh, they actually know how, what distance every player in the game has run during the game and what their average and maximum speed is and things like that. And um, I don't... You know, I, I haven't talked to enough soccer analysts to know how useful they find that data, but it has to be the case that, you know, knowing the position it's of every player at every moment is, is useful. We're always, the coaches are always going back to the players and saying, all right, well, here's the play that we like to run. Watch this video. What did you do wrong? Um, and, and so the, you, you can imagine where you could go with that, with that data. So I imagine we'll have that data one way or another pretty soon. Uh, it's much easier in basketball where most of the players are visible on, on TV most of the time. The so. only difficulty is they cross paths a lot. Right. So in soccer, they actually, the, the way they do it in soccer is every time two players cross paths, someone in some farm in England is in a warehouse and they, like, all right, this guy went here and this guy yeah. went here. You can't do that in basketball because they're just crossing all the time. Right. And so um, the sport presents a lot of problems that you don't have with sports like baseball. There's just way, way more interaction. Uh, so, you know, solving those interaction questions, either statistically or by getting more data, is. Uh, a place I think everyone who's working for a team is moving. Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty clear that uh, that basketball in particular there is a lot more uh, interaction complexity uh, com compared to baseball. Um, perhaps you could take me through a, a hypothetical scenario. If if um, Wayne brought up an example this morning of an uh, uh, example of uh, Celtics playing the Bulls in the playoffs last year, and he happened to notice that when Brad Miller plays with three small, with three guards that uh, they, they happen to, uh, the Bulls uh, uh, tended to perform relatively well under that scenario. So if you're in a seven-game series and you happen to notice this, um, 
maybe you could take me through a, a, how, how would this get discussed in terms of communication with coaches, players, the front office, uh, in terms of strategies. May, you know, I think one of, the, one of the most important things for statisticians is actually communication with the non-statisticians, particularly uh, decision makers, other decision makers. And we have, a, as a profession, sometimes we have a difficult time. We do some fancy analysis, and how do we get, get across to them what the message is? Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about the communication, in particular maybe through, a, through this sort of hypothetical scenario. What, what would happen? And, um, how, how would that, to the extent that you can, uh, so I first. any sure. ideas? So, so um, first of all, it varies pretty drastically based on the question that is being asked. So something, you know, people are always coming to me with some sort of new player rating system, and I say I don't spend a lot of time looking at player rating systems. I spend some time, but I spend more time answering whatever, you know, should we make this trade, what lineup should we play, things like that. And so um, a situation like that is, is interesting. It's, it's good that you bring up the playoffs because you actually don't change what you do so much on a night-to-night -night basis during the regular season in basketball. You just can't. It's not like a football game where um, you know, there's just 16 games and you have all week to prepare. We sometimes are playing five games in seven nights. Um, the two off days, there won't be practice those two days because you'll have played two, back -to -back, uh, two games back-to-back. -back. They want a day off before they play the next game and then there's another day off before they play the next two games. Um, and so the coaches tend to focus much more on doing the stuff that we do really well during the regular season. And then during the playoffs, it's a whole different story. Suddenly, you, you know you're going to be playing the same team for seven games. Usually, you have a few nights beforehand. Um, and you can make a lot of adjustments. So the, the, we do a lot more statistical work for the coaches during the playoffs than we do during the regular season. Um, it's not to say we don't do any during the regular season. But um, the, the communication lines are. are it really depends on the team. I think that's one thing that varies drastically by team. I think um, you know, the rules of the game are the same everywhere, but the people and the positions and the jobs are, are very, very different everywhere. So um, you know, I can only speak to our team. Um, we put together a big statistical packet for the coaches before every game, especially for the playoffs, uh, reviewing a bunch of you know, big and small things um, uh, about the opponent that we're likely to be facing. And then they'll come to me with questions. I'll go to them with things that we notice. Uh, there's a bunch of things that you know, we know to bring to their attention when it happens. And so um, it's a very sort of fluid process. There's not much uh, formality to it in, in some ways. And then in other ways, we have these, this sort of very formalized reporting system that actually happens without a lot of intervention now because we've put a lot of time and effort into creating a system to do that. Um, on the front office side, it's, it's a little different for me now just sort of because I've, I've, I'm much more involved in the non-statistical stuff now than I was. Um, and so I actually can drive that a little bit more myself than I used to be able to. But at the same time, you know, we have the smallest front office in the league and all four of us are in two, two offices next to each other with an open door between the mm -hmm. two and we're just shouting stuff back and forth all the time. So um, really depending on the question, it can vary pretty drastically. With so let me, let me just follow up that, sure. really depending on the question. How is it decided what questions you look at? Um, <laughs> so I suppose well, okay, if you're so in... If we're going to make a trade or we're thinking about one, um, you know, that, that's pretty clearly something that we ought to look at. Uh, other times, you know, the coaches will have questions. I'll come up with stuff for the coaches. Uh, I have a couple people working with and for me who uh, will come up with things that will bring to people's attention. It's, it's very, very informal. Um, there's a set of stuff that they want to know all the time, reports that both Danny and Doc and some of the assistants. Tom Thibodeau is notorious for needing enormous amounts of data. Um, sometimes too much, I think, actually, uh, although he knows I think that. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a constant challenge to sort of manage that, the question you just asked, which stuff will you be working on? Um, because sometimes the long-term R&D stuff actually is the most valuable stuff, and you can't ever get to it because there's all these immediate questions. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's different different places. You yeah. guys have each worked for other teams, so you probably have different experiences. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I, you know, so I'm just starting out, so, uh, and I'm uh, working remotely. I'm not uh, in Memphis. So I think that makes the dynamic uh, very different for me as well as the team hasn't been, you know, had someone there for 
a long time the way Mike's been uh, with the Celtics. So for me, I'm mostly interacting with uh, Chris Wallace, the GM, and I think that um, you know I would sort of pass him along uh, tidbits uh, as I sort of notice things, uh, similar to the way uh, Wayne mentioned it uh, earlier. Um, you know, I haven't really uh, I, I joined sort of essentially right after the uh, regular season ended, so I haven't quite been in that situation. But definitely, I've had um, you, you know very little interaction to date with the coaches. I'm expecting that that'll pick up a little bit as the questions become a little more uh, formalized. Well, Scott and I talked a little bit about the topic offline as far as the importance of communicating your ideas and your conclusions to the end audience. It's by far the most important part of the job. Uh, I came it's more important from, than being a good statistician. It absolutely. Oh, yeah. That's exactly my next thought. I, I, I came at one point from a, a mutual fund background where I was analyzing retail companies and recommending buy and sell uh, positions to a portfolio manager or portfolio managers and I quickly discovered that my stances were only good if they were actually executed so implementing that in the sports world is actually even more difficult especially if this is a new position to the team you're joining uh, which it was when I was in New Jersey so you really from the from the get-go I think Certain guys in this room, I know Jesse's working in Oklahoma City, you're developing a trust level with the organization, uh, with the coaches, with the GM, and that, that takes time. But if you're open to telling them when you don't know the answer and telling them why, I think they'll trust you more as opposed to I know the answer every time and this is right and this is what you have to do. Uh, also choosing your battles wisely when it's a really important uh, decision in your mind. It might not be a really important decision to the general manager or to the coach. Uh, be sure to make that clear. And then at the end of the day, if, if you are actually getting those things implemented, then you know you're being successful. You could be the best statistical analyst in the world and you know you're right 100% of the time and you knock the ball out of the park every time you do an analysis, but it only gets implemented one times out of ten. And the guy who's a little bit not less less aggressive, but not as accurate, but gets things implemented five times as often is probably the better analyst in my mind. And the reality is, I mean, when I was sort of, I was telling some people earlier, uh, sort of joining the Grizzlies now and just trying to get into it and trying to build our capabilities, I'm much more focused on mm -hmm. uh, having the basketball analysis just become part of the culture and less about doing the best draft analysis. Mm -hmm. You know, if we do the fifth or tenth Good. best draft analysis <laughs> this year, this year. Uh, you know, we'll be still, be, you know, you know, improving uh, relative and, uh, you know, and then we'll have time to get after some of the more second and third, third order effects as we've uh, kind of grown. It would seem to me that um, uh, as a statistician, my own, my own, uh, my own work, I guess, uh, really defining the questions uh, is, is some of the most important work, not only answering the questions, but defining what, what the most important questions are. And I, I could appreciate that, particularly, say, during the uh, regular season where you may have, uh, in the off season, you're, you may be evaluating players for trades and drafts and things like this. And regular season, you're trying to think about how to better your team in a very general sense. And then when you get into the playoffs, questions may become much more specific. You know, you're playing Cleveland. What are you going to do with LeBron? Are you going to foul somebody at, you know, particular stages? And uh, how are you going to handle, you know, very specific matchups and, and those types of things? Um, and uh, um, maybe you can speak to also uh, as, as decisions are made for uh, the teams in the leagues about in the league about um, uh, exactly how much reliance is is spent on uh, statistical analysis. Uh, you know, I you almost sort of get an impression as we as we watch uh, ESPN and see owners and and coaches and teams and. You get a sense of uh, sort of who's uh, who's more quantitative and who's more uh, gut oriented, um, and just, and you could feed somebody you know a particular analysis and say, well you know given the, the the data and given this analysis, we believe that this may be the optimal strategy. And you know somebody saying, well, despite the fact of what the data say, I don't really believe it. I still have a gut instinct that we should go this other direction. And uh, sort of how often does that that sort of thing happen? Um, and I'm sure there's, there's variation, but, um, you know, in a general sense, how much are, are people actually relying on analyses these days versus uh, sort of non-analytical uh, uh, strategies? And 
Well, here's, here's what's shocking. The more, and this is, I thought, one of the best points made the whole day was at the very end of Tom's presentation this morning. The more work I do, the more I realize how right yeah. Yeah. Danny and the coaches are. Like, so much of the time, they know what they're doing. Um, and and it's, it's as frequent when we disagree, I think, that I'm missing something, that, you know, than that they're missing something. Um, and so, I don't know if it's quite the same. It depends on the question. But, but um, I... You know, I don't think we make a front office decision now without looking at, at a bunch of data. Um, you know, the coaching stuff, also to Tom's point earlier today, there's a lot of different possible situations in basketball. And, um, you know, some of them are relatively easy to analyze and others of them are not relatively easy to analyze. And so, to some extent, you don't, you don't want someone only relying on, you know, if, if, if Danny and Doc told me tomorrow we're only using statistical models to make every decision for the rest of the franchise, it would be a disaster for the Celtics. I wouldn't want that to happen. So, um, you know, I, I just think there, there's no easy or one answer to that question. Uh, little disagreements happen all the time, but they're not really disagreements. It's more sort of, hmm. you use the data to sort of figure out what you know and what you don't know. And sometimes, you know, where the data and your gut are very different, that's actually the best result sometimes. You actually want that to happen. And you learn something that way. Yeah. I mean, I would just uh, say that I certainly I don't have a specific answer to that question, but that's that explicit question that we have talked about. It's sort of, you know, how, what role should it play? You know, my sense is that uh, the data in general is a little harder for the draft, and so my sense is you'll probably spend a little bit, you'll emphasize it in the draft a little bit less um, because just because players aren't fully formed and whatnot. Good. <laughs> I'm saying you love it every minute of this, aren't you, Mike? Uh, so uh, you know, but but again, I think that as an organization that's getting more and more into it, right? You know, you can imagine that we're kind of working our way up the curve to find sort of where we want to be on the sweet spot. You know, initially there's going to be a lot of skepticism. It's going to be a small part of what we're doing, and then um, over time, you know, assuming all goes well, it's going to become more and more integral to our thought process. Well, I think that the trend overall in the league, and, and I, I have to. As part of my role, I do speak with a lot of the statisticians and also the, the front office management of the teams, is that it is trending more and more towards an analytical approach, partially due to the changes in ownership that have occurred in our teams. So a lot of times the owners of today are coming from backgrounds where they own businesses or they ran hedge fund companies, and they're used to seeing in-depth analytical uh, studies on every major decision that their companies make and they want to see the same type of work uh, at their sports organizations. Uh, so for the most part that's probably the most major trend uh, in the last five to ten years and when you're talking about an expense that's probably one one thousandth of the overall budget an owner's not going to blink typically at, at making the decision to have someone in that role. So. It's, uh, it's a pretty valuable and a pretty high return on your investment uh, in, in, in my mind, and I'm biased, so take that with a grain of salt. But uh, for the most part, that's probably the main reason why it's continued to grow. Uh, one, because of the ownership piece, and two, because of the relative value of having someone in that role. Okay. Let me uh, ask the uh, crowd, uh, maybe we can begin to open it up a little bit, uh, questions and discussion. Anybody would like to jump in? Up at the top, Alok? Yeah, um, so this is more for Aaron and you know, you guys, I guess, report sort of to the general manager, but ultimately to the owner. Um, and I'm just thinking back to the MIT conference a couple months ago. Mark Cuban was there. He said the best, the best like, income financially, the best way, the best uh, time for a team is when they're continuously rebuilding, I believe he said. Um, so how much... <coughs> I'll start with that. I would say that, uh, <laughs> and do you want to say good now, no, no, or do you want to wait until I give my answer, by the way? <laughs> Mike, no in, comments there. I haven't said anything. <laughs> in my role, those kinds of questions, I think, are you know, well above my pay grade. So that's not, I am purely looking at the basketball. You know, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, questions of value and, you know, uh, you know, how much we want to spend for acquiring a specific player and things like that. But, um, you know, I think ultimately some of those, 
questions about the long-term high-level strategy, uh, you know, rest more with the owner and the GM. Maybe, you know, when you rise to Mike's uh, esteemed position, you have more influence. Yeah, you should see how the owners treat me. So you keep saying that. Um, how many people here have been to a Celtics home game? A good portion. All right. Who do you see sitting underneath the basket on either side? You guys know who sits there? Like the very first two seats. The owner? It's not so you. We got our top two owners sit under the basket. Oh, and okay. they do as much shouting at the refs as anyone in the building. <laughs> um, so we're just lucky. I, I, don't, I don't know that this is consistent across the league, but we're really, really lucky. Um, the team's definitely going to lose money this year. Um, but we want to win. So it's always been uh, every, every decision is made to, to make the team better um, and, and to win more games. Even if it's a long-term decision, you know, when the three years ago it didn't really look like the decisions <laughs> were being made to win more games, but they were. Um, and so, you know, whether or not it worked out at the time, we couldn't be certain. But, but um, we're just lucky to have owners who that, that's their biggest priority. Um, they grew up Celtics fans and they, they you know, they don't only see it as a public trust, but they that they see it at least partly as a public trust, and they they want to win. So, but I I don't know if that's true at every team. I, I can't speak to other owners. So he's questioning the no layup rule. <laughs> so the I, I can go, go into a little bit. I mean, it depends on your coach. I mean, Mike D'Antoni would say, let let him go. You know, don't give up a foul. And, and you're seeing a lot of the smarter teams now limit their fouls. They see how important a metric that is. Uh, when you're talking about giving up baby, basically a point and a half any time that there's a two-shot foul, it's a very efficient possession. So for, for you to think those types of thoughts is very much in line with what some of the, the smarter teams, I think, are already thinking. Um, you will notice if you look, just look at the typical per game stats even for the NBA teams, and you'll, you'll see a correlation between the top teams in terms of analytics and the teams that tend to foul. So that's, that's not a huge surprise. You're definitely on to something. And, uh, as far as the, the flagrant issue, yeah, we'd like to see a lot less of those. I think that's why they instituted the, uh, what is it, the breakaway uh, foul rule. I'm not an expert in those rules as of yet, but I think that's one of the reasons they, they limit those types of fouls if, uh, if they can prevent them, it, issue a technical and maybe two shots in the ball, something you like that. You have to be careful. It can be a clear path foul, too, if you uh, grab the correct. guy and you're not between him and the hoop is two shots in the ball now. Correct. So. Right. So I guess the, the question, uh, the same sort of thing uh, applies to, say, the, the hack-a-shack strategy. You're fouling a guy on purpose, throwing him to the line, uh, figuring that's going to benefit. Um, and I suppose the statistician's favorite answer to everything is it depends. Uh, if you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the hack-a-shack strategy is a good one, but you don't want to foul Ray Allen, um, figuring you're just giving, you're just giving points away. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, in baseball, uh, we, we sort of assumed in Tom's points today that, uh, or one of the assumptions was that bunting is bad, but maybe not all the time now, right? And so for some of these things, uh, the same sort of question applies. Is, is one of these strategies always bad, or is the answer it, it always depends? Um, you know, another, another typical strategy, let's say you're, uh, you've got a three-point lead and the other team has the ball with eight seconds left. Do, do you foul? Or, or do you play it out? 
And um, I don't. Would, would you say there's an answer, a correct, a, a correct answer to that question? And maybe the answer depends on whether you got Ray Allen on your team or whether you've got clock, whether you got other things. There is a Ray answer to that. There is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> Wayne. If you go watch our Chicago series, you'll see two different answers sure. by the same team. Sure. So, the intimidation piece. Right. I mean, yeah. If I go in every time and nobody touches me, I'm going to make them all. Mm -hmm. But if I think you're going to knock me, knock my block off, I'm not going to make them anymore. Or it's like Tom's analysis. You it's might bunt once in a while. You might knock a guy's head off just one time, maybe to start the game. And they won't forget that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but definitely a good question. I haven't really seen a lot of public analysis about the value of a foul in that sort of, you know, situation that, that you raised. I think that's uh, an interesting question. You know, there's lots of win probabilities based on points and time, and I, I haven't seen anyone sort of address the cost of the foul because it's so deferred and hard to get at. But these are some of the decisions that teams have to make. Yeah. And instead of sending me, you know, your list of the top ten players versus the next right. guy's list of the top ten players. Well, you can sign any of those ten, right? Um, Maybe. <laughs> um, the, uh, the, we have no exceptions left right now. Um, the, um, the, you'll get heard much more by a team if you actually send them something that's interesting to them rather than yet another player ranking metric that might be the average of three other player ranking right. metrics or something like that. Um, it, it's, it's, everybody wants to be playing fantasy basketball, but it, that's different. That's mm -hmm. different than what we do. And even fantasy basketball, I mean, at some level, a lot of the leagues, right, aren't all about one number. No, no, sure. Right? Course, <laughs> even fantasy basketball, so. Yep. I'm not knocking fantasy basketball. Where do we go to mm -hmm. Tom? Yep. Uh, I want to pass along a question somebody asked me earlier today, which is, how receptive are the players themselves to analytical thinking? And I know the answer will be it depends, but I'm kind of curious if you have any conversations on that. So uh, I had to give a talk to our courtside season ticket holders yesterday uh, and Scal was there and uh, he actually got asked that question and uh, the first thing he said was well most of what he said it doesn't matter at all uh, but then he talked for like 20 minutes about how useful it was so um, I think it varies really drastically um, some of the things you don't want the players thinking about you just want them to play and uh, especially a guy like Scal the more he's trying to compute things or figure out what to do on the court probably, you know, you know, you want him just playing. And there's a lot of guys like that. I think he'd tell you that. Um, the, the, uh, but there's other things you want him thinking about and he wants to be thinking about. So things like an opponent's tendencies where he's going to be guarding the guy, you know, he wants that and he wants video of it. Um, and so it, it varies really drastically. Some players have no interest. We'll give them things and it'll just stay right where we left it. Uh, and other guys take it home and read it and come back with questions and want video of certain things. And, um, so the answer is it depends, of course, but there are some players who are very interested in a lot of things. Uh, and then there's other things we just don't want to tell any of the players, um, you know, because it, 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 do, it doesn't impact how they play. It would be a front office decision -y sort of thing. Right. So, and to that point, I even know folks that, uh, you know, in roles like this that uh, intentionally don't want to interact with the players. So they're not biased and feeling like, oh, I really don't want to say that you know, Scout has to go or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I know people I, I, kind of consciously. I have a it. completely different answer than Mike. Um, it depends if you have a coach that can communicate those metrics mm. to the player and shows that that can affect the player's playing time. <laughs> he, he's going to have his minutes cut. He's very interested in what that piece of information is saying, and he will change it if uh, if he can at least understand what he needs to change, yeah. and if it'll mean he'll play more, he'll he'll be right. very and, receptive. And the advent of the video, right, is making that a little easier to communicate, I would think. To, to Ken's point, too, and this is really, really important, I'm never going and giving things to a player. That right. doesn't ever happen. Um, uh, it, it all gets filtered through the coaches, and one of the things I had to learn very quickly when I showed up with the team was, there's a lot of things going through a coach's mind. So I may bring him something that's clearly important, it's statistically significant, everyone agrees with the data, there's no disputes over it. He's got like 20 things that are important. He can only spend practice time on eight of them. The players might only remember four of them during, you know, after practice. And by the time the game rolls around, there might only be one or two of them that they can really focus on you know, in the huddle during the game. So 
it might be that my thing is important, but it's tense, and you can only do eight or nine in practice in a particular day, and those other eight things are more important. Um, and so, you know, really, there's a, a bunch of sort of gates that anything you think that ought to be communicated to the players has to go through, and 90% of the time, or more, 99% of the time, sometimes, depending on what it is, um, the coaches know better which things that, that will, you know, create the biggest return for the team. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's never the case of like me going to scale and saying, all right, you got to do these three things tonight. That doesn't happen. Um, but you know, they see they see some some work that that comes from my office, and sometimes it comes through the coaches. Sometimes it comes through our video guys. Sometimes it's a sheet of paper. They don't know where it comes from. Um, but but definitely players are interested in some data. It would seem like there'd be a lot of natural variation from player to player about how much they appreciate that stuff. Uh, we know we had a couple of uh, conversations uh, about this conference with some other players. Shane Battier, and one, one uh, who seems to be somewhat interested in a lot of this stuff, and Ray Allen and some others. Um, and even in baseball, I don't know, Tom, uh, how you answered that question was asked you today, but I know that, uh, you know, there's, of course, certain players that are avid about collecting data. Uh, Kurt Schilling was one, and and, and uh, but there are other players who think it's nothing but hogwash, uh, I'm sure. We had a question, yep, um, you. Now I'm gonna pull on Mike Zarin. <laughs> I'm definitely not allowed to talk about that. I apologize. <laughs> you guys can uh, maybe give your guesstimates. As yeah, to exactly. I don't really have any information what? for you, but I, mean, I think clearly we saw that players that in previous years would have gotten larger offers during free agency um, found it a little uh, harder this year. You know, certainly teams are carrying less players, right, since there's, they don't necessarily have to carry for uh, 15, uh, and many are opting for less. So I think it's an issue. I think that, well, you know, one thing that I think I'd be interested in, I don't have a lot of insight into this, is, you know, what role statisticians could possibly play in the next negotiations and sort of developing kind of, you know, neutral kind of uh, things that would sort of be in the long-term interest of both the players and the teams. We've, we're in a sort of very lucky position. Uh, I think of myself as like a really lucky kid, but the team is really lucky to be in a good spot right now. We, don't, we haven't been hit nearly as hard by the economy as, as other teams have, but it has definitely hit us. I also passing through my office are the sponsorship contracts, <laughs> and um, uh, that, you know, that business has changed pretty drastically across the league. I'm, I'm not just talking mm -hmm. about our team, but uh, across the league there's clearly been some impact of the economy on that. Uh, whether you know it or not, that all of those dollars end up in a pot called basketball-related income, and that's what determines the salary cap and the luxury tax numbers. Um, and so there's a big audit at the end of the year, and all the teams and the league, all those revenues get pulled together. And so as revenue goes down, the cap will go down. Um, yeah. I don't know what, you know, there's, there's been some ESPN reports on, on memos from the league and things, um, but I think it's really anyone's guess, you know, what basketball-related income this year looks like. It's it's uh, September right now. Not all the sponsorships are done. Most cities, again, we're really lucky. Most of our tickets, almost all of our tickets are sold. Every ticket we've put on sale has sold. Um, but you know, most cities aren't experiencing that. Uh, and so how it goes for the rest of the year, we'll, we'll just have to see. And I know that will affect the next round of CBA negotiations. But exactly how, um, you, know, you have to ask our, our owners that. Um, it's going to depend. You know, one thing that's very interesting is I was talking I was talking to the lawyers who negotiate the CBA on both sides, the players and the league, and uh, each of them were trying to tell me, it's, it's funny, there's this public view that there's the owners and there's the players, and they show up in a room and they right. each have a position and they argue. There's 30 owners and there's like 500 players, and not all the owners and all the players have the same views, so internally, each of those guys is going to have to herd their cats somehow to some position before they even get to talking to each other, and so it's nearly impossible to know right now here we go. If, if a coach changes teams, does he want to bring a statistician with him? And how are you under contract? He can't go to work for a competitor. Um, are you asking me about my contract specifically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would assume that a coach, if he has a good statistician, you're, you're sort of part of his team, part of his coaching yeah. staff. I would also assume that you have a lot of proprietary knowledge. I'm 
quite positive that all three of us are covered by pretty good non-disclosure yeah. agreements. I haven't and seen yeah. many guys cross teams yet. Right, but I would be. But it's it, would, new. it would be a real achievement, I think, if we got to that point where the coaches were like demanding that. The, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's happened yet either. The, the um, interesting thing about the role is typically it's a bifurcated role, so. Mike oftentimes will deal with both the front office and the mm -hmm. coaching staff. So they both have an allegiance. And like most companies, there's almost a, what is the, what is the term, uh, non-compete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if the coach it's leaves, it's either understood or it's in the contract that you're not going to leave. So typically they don't want to burn a bridge there if a but, coach does. But I would say in my case, I'm working with Chris Wallace. He used to work with Mike, and I think the, sure. the fine work that Mike did uh, helped him sort of, and I think this would be much more likely, is that it would make people appreciate the value a statistician could bring, and then they would sort of make sure that their new team sort of developed that capability, even if they couldn't get their hands on Mike. I got hired by Danny if he ever left and went somewhere else, which I just couldn't imagine. I, I don't know what would happen. I, I know what the contractual provisions say, but... Um, mm -hmm. You know, in, in sports, oftentimes, you know, pe the, the contract says one thing, whether it's enforced or not is, is another thing. I, I have no idea what would happen then. Uh, hopefully he doesn't leave. <laughs> but uh, um, I, I spend more time working for the front office than the coaches, or at least I have. It, it's, it shifts at different times. Did you? Yep. <laughs> I think it definitely could be affected by, uh, in particular organizations, let's just say. Uh, and, um, but at the same time, I think, uh, you know, it is in general becoming more valued, more and more teams are doing it. Yeah, I you know, I, I think cool. you look at some teams that have made drastic cuts to their front office staffs uh, across a bunch of functions, so the heat reduced payrolls on everyone. Other teams have cut a bunch of, of staff members, and so um, it's definitely having an effect on front offices. Um, at the same time, more front offices are becoming interested in this stuff, and so how the interplay between those two things works out is, is interesting. We have the smallest front office in the league. Hopefully it doesn't get any smaller. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're, we're not looking to hire anyone else right now, so, um, you know, I, I would love to have more help than I have. But uh, um, there's no question that stuff's having an effect. But again, that's a very team-specific thing. So you said that your your office is uh, um, uh, not a large office. So I guess oh. some of the other offices are larger. Would would you interpret that to mean that that perhaps uh, um, they're not valuing uh, uh, statistics as much as uh, perhaps they could? Well, I mean, to the extent we've invested in. Analytics. I mean, you, you traded yeah. away seven guys to get one player. We did trade away seven guys. It was five it guys. It worked out well for picks, you. But, but, yeah, um, that was a good trade. I, I feel <laughs> confident about that trade. Um, but uh, you, you know, I think we've invested at least as much as any other team except maybe one in this stuff. And yeah. so I, I, I don't feel right. like you can argue like we, we don't value it very much. Mm -hmm. um, right, you'd say the front office is small, but the right. statistical the st capability sure, is actually statistical quite large for the league. pretty good in, mm -hmm. in, in our office, I think. Uh, it could be better. There's tons of stuff we don't know. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, I, I think it's a function of the way Danny likes to operate. He finds a few people whose opinions he trusts. We all work our butts off. You know, one of our scouts watched 29 games last January. So l let me ask this. There's a number of uh, academics in the, in the audience. And uh, at the NBA level, for example, would there be, uh, are there any opportunities for any sort of collaboration that would, say, uh, an academic statistician uh, who has expertise in, you know, uh, sort of novel statistical methods, would there be opportunities for collaboration at, at all? Or is everything so uh, sort of tied up that that, that would not that would not the, happen. The two biggest difficulties are, one, the uh, academic people almost always want to publish their findings, um, which we, like, the last thing we want to do is support some guy doing an important project for two years and then have it be published and have all of them start using it. So, um, and then the second thing is, I don't think any of the NBA teams are nonprofits. And so, um, if you actually want to work for an NBA team, you're, 
you can't do it for free. You have to either get credit for it or get paid, uh, or else you're violating the federal fair labor laws. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's kind that's of your legal that's influence kind of right there, twist. isn't it? I'm, yeah, I'm supposed <laughs> to be like the team lawyer too, but but. Uh, the, uh, so are you saying it's not possible? No, or I'm not it? saying it's not possible at all. In fact, we've done some really good collaborations. <laughs> it's just you've got to work your way around those two things. Um, and if you're willing to do it, I mean, I, I did it for two years for free, getting school credit. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, there are tickets involved and things. But, but the, the um, not good tickets. The same ones my dad's had up in the balcony since 1972. Um, but... Uh, you know, we, we, we do great work with, with some people in academia. They just have to be wanting to, to keep it quiet, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but the other thing I would say is that uh, you may, to your point, glad this, you know, those exact same thoughts. I think, though, that there is a little bit of an opportunity, just like you talked about the coaching staff, and, you know, maybe it's the tenth most important thing, sure. and you're never going to do it, as sort of steering people to, like, these are the interesting things I think would be great to work on. Mm -hmm. um, and then, well, sure, everybody's going to get it, but the reality is, you know, no one, you know, theoretically no one knew it. Or, for all you know, certain teams, you know, maybe Mike already knew it, and by asking someone here to work on it, I've actually sort of, you know, picked something up relative well, to that. you sort of got a job through doing that stuff, right? I mean, yeah, in a way, similarly, you, you, yeah. Aaron built a website that uh, broke down publicly available play-by-play -play data in ways that no one had ever done publicly before. Uh, right, exactly. Turned, you know, and, and so that, that, that's been a real significant step. So there's always opportunities to do stuff it's just with the team, it gets a little bit more complicated, but not necessarily too complicated. Mm -hmm. Or you could just get paid doing it. We go <laughs> in the back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You. If you're good enough, you, you get paid. Uh, uh, it's just, you know, random example. <laughs> that might happen to have the URL, yeah. So, uh, I mean, I guess I would say that uh, I think it's been useful, uh, you know, not necessarily because uh, people, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't want to claim that anyone uh, is explicitly using it in their data, but I think, you know, people find it useful to uh, uh, just sort of know your name, that you're able to sort of say that you've done some stuff. And uh, frankly, I personally just sort of, you know, it's nice to see other people using my stuff. Uh, you know, I think one paper here used uh, the data that's uh, publicly available uh, on basketballvalue.com. So I think it really just sort of helps establish your credibility and the fact that you're capable of uh, doing stuff. And it's not just theoretical and that, you know, it's not just something you're wondering. I also think it helps show a commitment inevitably I think to put something together that you know you believe is valuable to the community is going to take you enough time that it demonstrates a level of commitment that everyone will appreciate, even if that particular question you're answering or you know the area you're working on uh, is uh, you know not specifically something that's uh, as uh, relevant to folks. So again, I think that uh, my advice would be um, to you know just sort of you know work to do good work. I think advice that applies whether it's trying to get in with an NBA team or really at any job. I think that. Um, you know, sort of my, my work in industry, and I'm sure you probably heard this uh, back in the day. I mean, ultimately, uh, I think the way to succeed, which I, I didn't fully appreciate uh, early on, was, you know, just whatever it is you're doing, you know, make sure you do it really well. And I think that if people see that you've done that, you know, you know, for instance, so basketballvalue.com, you know, I've got the play-by-play -play data I'm doing, uh, and then I do some adjusted plus-minus calculations on it. I'm not advocating that as the number one metric, and anyone who doesn't use it is it. Um, you know, it's foolish. It just happens to be where I sort of thought I could could uh, help out, but I'm trying to sort of do it uh, as well as I can. And so I think, you know, by demonstrating that you can work in, you know, whatever niche you're trying, trying to carve out for yourself, that'll make folks realize that, hey, I've got a different problem, but I can see, you know, this person can really uh, contribute once they set their mind to it. One thing that's pretty interesting is of all of the people working for teams doing statistical analysis, I think it might be only Ken and I who didn't publish something first. Mm -hmm. Pretty much Probably every, because we started earlier. Right. Pretty much everyone yeah. else has got something. You know, Dean has a book. Ed was all over a, a website publishing all sorts of really good work. Um, and other people in this room are, you know, have similar stories. So. And usually they get um, poached. So yeah, it's a I mean, great that, that's, way to uh, get almost all yourself the people seen. Have been Teams hired. do pay attention. Yeah. And wouldn't you say that you guys are get often asked folks that you might have, have uh, encountered because a new team is thinking about stuff? Oh, I have the, the sense time. that happens all, all the, the time, time, right? All the time. Some other questions? Yep. You. Yep. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, the very first thing I did when I started working for the Celtics was to work on the draft. I, I did that before I did anything else. Um, so the answer to your question is yes, and that's also. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is data that's available, but it's a, it's a hard problem, I think. Right, right. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, it's a lot, well, it's very difficult just also because the pool of players to be drafted is so small. The, um, if you look at the, define success however you want. Mm -hmm. If you look at the success rate by draft pick, it's very right. steeply curving down. Mm -hmm. And so um, you don't know, you know, usually it's very rare that you're trading with someone like the day of the draft, although, you know, we, we did that a couple times recently, but, but um, most of the time, if you're doing it in advance, it's really difficult to know where the team's going to finish because tenth is very different from second. Um, and then there's so a lottery confounding that too. The, the other thing is that the marketplace around the draft has changed somewhat in the mm -hmm. past few years, and so um, it's a difficult question to answer. I, I'm not, I, I'm not, sort of, I'm not only dodging it because I can't say some things, but I'm also dodging it because it's really, really hard to value a pick unless you're receiving it like at the time of the draft. If you're receiving it at the time of the draft, you probably have a good idea of who it is that you're looking at, and hopefully you've developed some value for that person. Um, but, you know, in the, the NFL, there's, I don't even know how many rounds there are in the NFL. It goes to Mr. Irrelevant in like the 30th round or something like that. I don't know how far it goes. It goes really, really far. How many? Seven, Seven rounds. But, okay, so, but that's still a lot more than two. Um, you know, and especially when you look at most of the second round picks in the NFL probably make the team. Uh, most of the second round picks in the right. NBA aren't on the team a year later, and so right. um, uh, it's 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 difficult to evaluate the, the value. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So no, it's a tough problem. Yeah, there's a lot of variation, uh, as you said, and. Uh, um, but yeah, you know, if I, you know, I have a paper up on 82 games that sort of has that curve, and I see, you know, Rollins recently did a, a series on that as well on 82 games. You might want to check out. Go question in front. Uh, yeah, question for Ken. I, earlier, when we were talking about uh, future data resources, especially the video stuff that's uh, going to be coming out, I think you guys said that it will be made available to the public eventually. I'm wondering if you have more details because the NBA actually decided yes, this. Uh, Well, I, th I think for, to a certain extent, some things have been already been made available. Uh, the, the hot zone charts in terms of the, the visual aspect has definitely been made available and uh, makes things a lot easier in terms of accumulating shot locations and where players tend to shoot from. Uh, has that been mixed with the video yet? No, it has not. Uh, however, I, I believe Synergy does have that capability, and, and we are definitely looking at implementing more web tools that would have that type of functionality. I, I don't have any timing on it. It's not my department, but those discussions are definitely ongoing. And the people that are working in those areas, they've actually really ramped up those efforts. So uh, as a fan, I'd be excited to see what they're, they're coming up with. Exactly. Well, one exactly. thing that happened a year ago is Synergy actually signed a deal with the league that gave Correct. ESPN access to their video data. And so you're actually starting to see that show up a little bit in some ESPN stuff more and more. And so that's kind of an interesting development too. Why don't we take uh, uh, one last question, then we're probably going to have to – let's take two, two last questions, and then we'll have to wrap up in the middle here. <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, that's actually something I, I took a look at uh, for the team uh, recently. And I mean, my sense is that uh, personally, I think that uh, there isn't, I think the spirit of it is good, but I think that there's the issue that my sense it's trying to address, which is sort of teams tanking 
you know, it's really only focused on the very worst teams, and actually a lot of the impact can happen. Um, I forget the exact example. It was like the ninth and the tenth team or something by, you know, they were kind of all bunched around 30 games. And so the impact of the incentive for them to lose was actually much higher than it was for, like, Sacramento or, or uh, Oklahoma City or, or Memphis. So uh, my sense is that the spirit of it's good. There are, are definitely ways they could change it to make it a little more consistent and so that it's addressing the issues for all the teams and not just, say, the worst two teams in the league. I have, maybe this is just me, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about changing the rules. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what to do with the rules as they are, and, and I, don't, I don't know why that is. I, it's just not something I spend a lot of time. There's so many other things to work on that we don't know about the current rule set that this cha rule changes make me. I just got plenty of other things to we do. We were probably more interested in the lottery this year than you. Well, so. uh, trust me, we've been, we've been there. <laughs> so. Why don't we go here for a last question? I'm going to say, I, I think I don't particularly, uh, since I'm just starting out, I don't have a specific thing that has had a tremendous impact yet. We had a hot dog machine. <laughs> and and it really wasn't that good. And uh, I think I had a lot of say. No, I'm just kidding. We, we did actually have a hot dog vending machine in our really? concession area. It Damn. did not last more than a few months. I apologize hot to anyone who's in that business. Um, <laughs> That's a, that's a very hard question. I think it, it's never really been for me uh, one trade having an impact on or one uh, game in the playoff series that I found uh, satisfaction from. I found more satisfaction in terms of garnering the trust of people that didn't know me from a brick in the wall uh, when I first started in the organization. Um, I was brought in by the management and the ownership group, but to get to know the people within the organization to, to garner their trust, I think, was probably more important than any one uh, situation. Yeah, con convincing Danny that a data-driven data yeah. approach is worthwhile is probably the, the best thing. But the other thing I'll say is that there, there's probably a couple trades that we haven't done <laughs> hmm. that I may have had more of an impact on. And I'm not saying I don't have any impact on trades that we have done, but, but um, um, there's a couple trades or signings that, that haven't happened, um, that you don't think about those things. There's, we, we have hundreds and hundreds of trade conversations, and, and many of them get serious. And so a, a lot of the impact sort of doesn't get seen in ways you might expect. Um, but, but there's definitely impact there. All right. Well, uh, l let me, let's all thank the panelists. Let's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, let it, let it.